Splitting Hairs, episode 13. Lucky 13. How are you, Annabelle? <laughs> Good, how are you? Excellent. What's going on today? All right, well, so today we're going to talk about technology in the string world. Oh, are you sure account. that's appropriate for a classical music show? Well, it's only been eight seconds, so have a listen. No. Okay. <laughs> it's either going to, is it, is it helping or hindering us? Oh, good point. Uh, to today, all the way from however many years ago, centuries ago, till now in the 21st century, all the stuff that's changed and evolved and, you know, changes this classical world of ours. Mm-hmm. And the attitudes towards it has probably um, hindered progress a little bit as well. I can imagine that. Hmm. So what, okay, you're running this show, so um, let's go. Well, when you think technology, I think we immediately go to like, oh, okay, iPhones and iPads and microphones and Mm. things like that. But when you think of the classical world, really the first bit of technology we had or developments in the violin um, were things like the shoulder rests and chin rests and modern bows and strings and things. Mm. So if you think about the Baroque violin, when they made those changes to it, that would have been that new technology of that time. What do you think of that? Yeah, would you include bow changes? Yeah, that, yeah, bow that changes. That kind of thing but... as well? Yeah, like all the angles are changing, the length of the bow and everything. Hmm. I know it's not like a microphone, but um, yeah, there. those things made a huge difference over time, didn't they? Hmm. But the cha- the changes would have been, it's changed the way we've been able to hold the violin and then play the violin. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. Which which changes things like, oh, okay, let, well, let's get specific right away. Let's go to, how about chin rests? Okay, so you know all those um, paintings of Renaissance and Baroque violinists. They're holding it down their arm. It's mm. nowhere near their head. <laughs> so, yeah. so they're probably in first position the whole time. They're hardly even moving up and down. And if they are, they're just kind of snaking up and down a little bit. Um, yeah, so as the decades progress and music gets a little bit harder, I guess they need to shove it under their chin. And I don't know if any of you out there has played a violin without a chin rest. I mean, I know we're used to a chin rest now, but it is a really strange sensation it's almost like if you don't have a shoulder rest or a chin rest the violin slips all over the place yeah so um the chin rest would have been very useful just to kind of help it sit under your face a little bit better what kind of chin rest do you have is it a big one or a small one Uh, or i went through a process i'm still going through it but no i had um i think it's called a guaneri model of chin rest Uh and it just i couldn't it for the years it for years it just took me forever to figure out that that's what was causing me discomfort in my playing I thought it was I uh, thought it was on my shoulder rest for a while but it was actually my chin rest and I removed it and I put on a little plastic girl or one it's small it's light it's thin and it is just more flat as well it's perfect mm. oh. I, I, I've oh. known so many people to go through this OCD period of time where they need exactly the right chin rest, exactly the right shoulder rest. So let's talk about pros and cons of those two things. Those two things are really, really related. The chin rest and the shoulder rest are the two things that change the size of what you're sticking under your face. Well, just in just a second, it's like the developments of those two things have enabled us to be able to play the repertoire that later came, you know, afterwards. The harder the repertoire the, the more you need stability. Stability. And so, you know, I think that's a that's a pro, you know. Um, it's changed the instruments, changed what we can do with it. But I think it's definitely a pro that if you find the right setup, you need to be able to just play with a proper shoulder rest that's fitted perfectly for you or chin rest because I know friends that have really long necks and they need a higher chin rest and I can't do that. And yeah. Then at, and then you look at someone like Isaac Stern, he couldn't use any of that because he basically had no neck. So <laughs> it's it actually enabled who can play violin as well and more comfortably. Uh, and it's, uh, look, as usual, it's a personal taste thing as well because we have our, you know, Anne Sophie Musha who doesn't have a shoulder rest at all. Oh, I'm amazed. I've been up close to her. How mm. is it staying there? You know, has she got really super sticky skin or something? Because she wears <laughs> sleeveless dresses. How does it sit there and well, stay I d- there? Well, I know she, she wears sleeveless dresses because of no shoulder rest. Oh, okay. Maybe she's got this special 
Um, maybe she's had plastic surgery on her collarbones to make it like a little corner <laughs> so she just sits it in there. But if you think about how if a beginner nowadays, it's immediately chin rest, shoulder rest, and you just learn how you, you, your technique is molded yes, around yes, that. Yep. So if you are immediately taught with none of those things, your technique will mold around that. That's right. And and I, also what, what tends to happen is if you are one of those with – uh, molded around shoulder rest chin rest as i am um it makes it hugely insecure an insecure experience playing without it but what i used to do as a student was take it off i would take the shoulder rest off to practice what it would feel like shifting without a shoulder rest without the crutch of okay my arm is just free to move because my head is holding that violin in place. So what would happen if you took the shoulder rest away? I've How? Done that. Yes, exactly. And I, I believe that we all should do it just yeah. in the same way as we should all try a Baroque bow. We should try the um, situation that used to be. So <laughs> I that d- I was sorry. I was sitting in one of my string classes once and I asked a question because we were talking about not using a shoulder rest versus using one. And I put mm. my hand up and I said, should we all be trying to not use a shoulder rest at some point just to sort of build that half of the technique? And everyone looked at me like I was insane for even asking that Aww. question. It's like, if you think about it, it's an attachment to the instrument. It's a different type of technique to play without it. So mm. why wouldn't you want to train both sides of that muscle? Oh, uh, <laughs> look, I'm with you. I, I, I Absolutely. And not only that, if you forget your shoulder rest, and you go to a gig. Or it breaks. Or it breaks or whatever. You don't have a shoulder rest. What are you going to do? Go yeah. home. And if you unfortunately are playing and it falls off halfway through because they do slip off. <laughs> yes. You, you don't be the, don't pick, keep going. You have to keep going. Yeah, so that's right. That's right. You should right. know. Like, I don't think people should only play bark on Baroque instruments or Baroque bows, but you should try it yeah, out. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it gives you more variation and more variety in your uh in, in your technique and what's yeah. wrong with that you know and and it also goes with the idea that you can't predict life like anything can happen at any moment so you have to be extremely flexible in the same yeah. way as in the same way as don't practice the phrase exactly the same way every time yeah. try a few different ways go a little bit free time yeah, and know, then you have choice when you get to the moment because it's all about living in the moment people yeah. <laughs> that's like that famous um Ray Chen video where he's playing Shoster Concerto and he snaps his E string and he finishes off the phrase as best he can. He immediately flip like changes the the violin over with the concert master yeah. and he keeps going and he yeah. just flings out some strings from his pocket, keeps going. And that that <laughs> that you you can't plan for that. No, that that's is right. in the moment and that's how you control your emotions, kind of thing. But that's absolutely, a that's a different topic. But um, it's yeah, that I mean, wonderful light heartedness towards life, you know, and and the light heartedness can't happen if you're you're as you well know if you're in that OCD phase of needing to find exactly the right chin rest, exactly the right shoulder rest, and having no pain because people think that, um, and this goes with our episode on um, the body is our instrument. Um, if you if you expect you're never going to have any pain from doing something extremely difficult and, and taxing on your body, that's just crazy thinking. Yeah, but I I do find it uh, I find it annoying when you go and you purchase an instrument for the first time, or well, not first time, but if you purchase an in- instrument and it's already got this setup on it that's not your setup, mm. it's like I only I, I it hit me like a ton of bricks. I when I bought my violin, it had this particular model of chin rest and a Whitner tailpiece on it, mm-hmm. which I kept for years. I didn't even question, you didn't question it. it. I just thought, oh, yeah, fine. And then <clears throat> this gets 10 years down the track, and I'm like, I'm actually uncomfortable, and I want to experiment on other things, and that's more the tailpiece thing. But it's like I took that chin rest off, and I threw it away. That was Because <laughs> once I tried other models, and there's some that I definitely won't ever try because they're too high or they're too wide, it's just like, no. But, you know, mm. the, just the concept of, hold on, that's not the setup that I picked. That's somebody else has picked that for me. Mm. Why can't I take it off? Oh, yeah. But there's is it, my grievance. That's that's understandable. But is it which came first, the chicken or the egg situation with this technology that we're talking about, these, these external fixture, fixtures that, that develop over time and they change? I mean, there's all sorts of extremely complex shoulder rests and chin rests now, mm-hmm. ones that swivel, ones that look like... Um, ones that aren't actually attached to the violin, yeah. but clipped onto the chin rest. Yes, because I, I, there's there's all these ideas that it, uh, the more things that are touching the violin, the less reverberant the violin will oh, be. God. So all of these... Um, 
shoulder rests, chin rests develop according to those ideas? And are we just going a little bit too far with it all? I mean, are we are we going a bit psycho about it? It's a bit obsessive. Yeah. Bit, I, I'm perfectly fine with somebody in this. Then this is more set up than, well, still technology. Mm. You know, I'm doing that, trying different strings and tail pieces and pegs and, and chin rests and shoulder rests because you have to find what's comfortable for you. But once you get down to, like, people weigh tail pieces because at point something of a gram makes that much difference to the sound it's like maybe you just need to practice more <laughs> and, and let me let me just let me just get in here and say it doesn't matter how much of this stuff you fiddle with if you're not feeling good inside your heart and soul and if your body's not relaxed none of that stuff makes yeah, a difference the, the technology is uh, that's the help it can that can help you but if you're not thinking beyond that that's right and if you're mentally relying on that as the the solution to all of your problems that's that's the danger zone for the Mm. for the mental um mental illness that comes from being obsessive about things so this early technology that was invented around the violins we've talked about chins and shoulder rests the bow development i want to do a whole other episode on bow development because i'm obsessed but yes bows definitely changed but strings also was something that is still string technology on. is unbelievable i mean look you and i both have tried so many different kinds of strings and as i said before it's usually the mood that i'm in that affects um the way i play but strings mm. do make the most immediate difference i've found yes even from the most basic concept here right old strings versus new strings if you're smashing your strings to death and they go dead and you you refuse to change them because you think that you know you're used to them and you're too scared to change them even changing your strings it's like a a tonal facelift for the violin can i tell you a really embarrassing funny story yeah when this was when i was really young right i i wasn't really taught by teachers like oh this is how like violin maintenance and so one time my teacher was like <laughs> When was the last time you changed your strings? Oh, and I said to her, since buying this instrument, <laughs> never. And I'd never changed them. And then so she immediately went, oh, my gosh. And she put on a brand new pair of obligato strings on there and was immediately just like, oh, my gosh. It's like no one told me I had to change my strings ever. And I was really young. Yeah. You know, bit That's of, not bit fair. Of, How are you supposed to know that? Yeah. That's but, right. I mean. The immediate change, and I mean, I never changed them since I bought that instrument. <laughs> how, how long? How long was that? Um, how long was it? Like a year or a year and a half? I want to say maybe two years. Two years. Okay. Yep. But, you know, it's just, first of all, teachers, if you're out there, teach your students violin maintenance, and that's a thing. Oh, um, wow. But, yeah, I mean, you're right. String, string technology is still going on. A lot of it is total crap, and then a lot of it's actually quite genius. Um, yeah, I think everyone should try gut strings because it will just change your perspective over <coughs> metal and synthetic strings. Absolutely. If you have the time, you should try raw gut strings. But um, make sure you tune your violin down a little bit because they're not, I don't know, the, the, the tensions have, are all. Can you have raw gut and tune it to 440? Yeah, look, um, I've done a few projects like that where the requirement was raw gut strings but we're still going to play at 440 because the chamber organ is tuned at 440 or the harpsichord is tuned at 440 and it's just too much trouble to bring the whole pitch down but you know there's evidence that in the baroque some some towns in germany were tuned up to 443 so it 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 just depends on a whole bunch of stuff and it's not even really that relevant what the point of trying raw gut is is again to get more flexibility and to get more um knowledge of how, what you have to do to get a sound out of a, a, a gut string, which is mm. very different from what you do um, getting a sound out of a purely synthetic string. And then there's that middle ground, which is what I'm on at the moment, wound gut. I'm on wound gut. Yeah, yeah. and wound gut has all sorts of beautiful um, aspects to it, but also a few annoying things as well. So um, it can be the happy medium, but it can also be – a bad compromise, d- depending on what brand of wound gut string you yeah, get. Yeah, I can't, I can't sit here and say to people you should only be on gut or only this particular exactly. brand or this particular setup of an instrument or you should use shoulder rest or you shouldn't. It's completely personal. But I think every <clears throat> student and performer needs to spend their own time 
like asking themselves, oh, this chin rest did come with this violin. Why? Is I'm, am I comfortable with it? Try something else. Like, yeah. Just you, you totally need to take control over that. Experiment yourself. Experiment, yeah. So, so what other technology can we talk about besides these little external <clears throat> fixtures? Well, these fixtures really, I mean, 19th century and 20th century was shoulder rest and, and, and things like that and synthetic strings. That's the instrument. Yeah. And then once you get to sort of 20th century, it started things like recording. Yeah, so recording technology, that's right. Um, amplification and the electric violin really, you know, that's that's the technology I think people think of. And I just wanted to point out earlier that things like a chin rest was a, a new technology of its time. Yeah. So now, I mean, 20th, <clears throat> 20th and 21st century technology has completely changed again. Um, yeah, I and, think it's... and the 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 way that recording technology has forced a new culture of performance. Yeah, that's that's been a big change and a big uh, con, actually, as opposed to pro. Well, because, why do you think it's a con? Well, I it's a con because <laughs> it's a con. Um, <laughs> it's a con because uh, the the attitude of performance becomes. Uh oh, this is captured now forever. So we need to make sure there's no mistakes. Now that didn't immediately happen when things were recorded. In the in the early days of recording, recordings were done in one take. And so the performance attitude was still authentically one take. This is a concert, it just happens to be recorded. Okay, so yep. that's okay. But as the decades progress, oh, this is captured forever. We can't make mistakes. We can cut the tape we can redo that bit we can stick the tape together and this was happening in in film as well i mean this we was... may or may not do that on this show if we accidentally <laughs> drop a swear word or say something that makes us look stupid and i maybe go in and do the uh, little snip snip oh yeah, yeah, there's sound been, great. yeah there's been quite a few things that i've sounded <laughs> extremely stupid and i've guilted annabelle into cutting it out so oh, I've, I've cut myself out before i'm just like i sound ridiculous yeah let's this get rid of that bit yeah so um recording technologies in interesting i wasn't really going to reference this article because i can't find it but there was this very interesting article that schoenberg arnold schoenberg had something to do with he recorded transfigured night twice and the first time he recorded it it was much more um free form flowy the bowings were kind of more like what he had originally conceived it was it was about bowings actually and then the second time he recorded it um the attitude towards uh, recordings had changed. So in that short period of time, maybe it was a 10-year period or something, when they came to it again, they were changing up the bowings so that the sound would be more full or more sustained or, or you know, just different for the purposes of a recording that was going to be captured forever. So if anyone's read this article or heard about this article, please, you know, link it because it was an extremely interesting article which, which proved that the recording industry changed the way musicians performed. Not only that recordings were cut up and stuck, stuck back together again. I mean, for example, now, technically, you're allowed to release a recording in the orchestra world. You're allowed to release a recording and call it a live recording, even though there are up to, I don't know, 100 edits or whatever. So you're still allowed to call it a live recording. Um, so what... What that means, that's kind of awful, actually, when you think about it. It's either a live recording or it's not. But, you know. I don't want to hear people coughing and clapping, so I'm all for just... Oh, so you don't mind, you don't want that. Some people love hearing the coughing and clapping because then they really know that they're in a... No, when it, I'm, I'm really particular. I'll sit in a live audience and go nuts. But if it's a recording, I prefer just... Mm, the clean. The absolute clean. I'm, I'm really particular about that kind of thing yeah but see this is you having been uh having grown up with very very clean produced recordings when you so when i hear something like i've got recordings from the 60s and earlier like just you can hear the cracking in it because that's the technology they recorded yeah yeah and it's like okay i have to i have to listen past that to how are they actually playing that piece yeah so recording technology's gotten better so what are the cons about that? I mean, recording technology is so fantastic. It's if I if I was to relate it to the pop world, I would say 
recording technology is so good now and we do so many edits and so many takes and we make sure it's all perfect. So the pop analogy is it's like auto-tune. Yeah. And so the extreme of it is not great, you know. And for students, if you are if you are trying to you shouldn't be doing this, but mimicking emulate recordings, yeah, yeah. then it's first of all, it's not your own performance and your own interpretations. Uh, I say that loosely <laughs> yeah. after previous discussions. Um but you're you are listening to something that is perfect and if you're not living up to that that can really bring you down yeah that's right but the pro of that is you think a human being is doing that so you're aspiring to that level so arguably the recording industry has made people better it has made people aspire to a higher level even if it's a little bit fake it doesn't matter so i believe i mean you can even compare you can compare the berlin phil from 1946 to the berlin phil now i mean this is a totally different experience I mean, basically all the good players left Berlin in 19, after the war, but that, that's beside the point. The sound, the, the technology, the microphones, the performance standard. I mean, you try and get into Juilliard now compared to ages ago. Like <laughs> the, the standard, the world standard of string playing has risen. There is no doubt about that. Okay, so I'm thinking about performance technology, like um, how concert halls have um, a- amplification, but it's called enhancement. So you've got this, if you're in a, a theatre that's for speaking, uh, like a music theatre where everything's supposed to be amplified, but a, a symphony orchestra finds itself in there. Like in the little country towns, you've got these all-purpose venues with no acoustic. So some of those places have um, the technology to slightly amplify the orchestra. So it's an enhancement rather than, um, which is great because it means orchestras can go into non-orchestral venues and and spread the orchestra love. Great. Just, yeah, just because orchestral venues, speaking of technology, those have been designed to get the natural acoustics yes. out of the instrument. So that technology in itself is incredible. I think, correct me mm-hmm. if I'm wrong, but the Melbourne Recital Centre is really significant because isn't the hall suspended? Is that correct? I don't even know what suspended means. Let's leave this in. I'm happy to say on Splitting Hairs that I don't know everything. Well, I do know that when that hall was being built, it um, like so much. I'm going to have to look it up because this is incredible. But the acoustics of that hall were so well curated that it's incredible. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, concert right. halls are their own piece of technology. Yeah, absolutely. And and the, if, if something's got plastic chairs and carpets and absolutely no acoustic, then that's fine if you're amplifying everything like mm. uh, music theater but if you find yourself in in a in in an orchestra in a small country town uh, and the the hall's great but it's not made for orchestras then you you need that little bit of an enhancement a little bit of acoustic and we don't always get that so we have to kind of just play a little bit lighter and just a little bit nicer. We can't sort of smash it. Yeah, like it we... does change how you have to play. Yeah, if so the can... venue changes how you have to play. Whereas Recital Centre, the Melbourne Recital Centre, as you well point out, is one of those beautiful, beautiful halls. But there is so much natural reverberation mm. that everything builds on top. All the sound stacks up on itself and it ends up being loud all the time. So you have to play heaps softer in the Recital Centre. And heaps slower because there's so much reverberation that all the notes blend into to one and kind of clash. So yeah, it's a bit of a skill to know how to play in, in all sorts of different different venues. But and that's that's good. That makes us flexible. We have to be flexible because we've either got the recital center or we've got, you know, the Warren and Bull um theatre, multi purpose <laughs> theatre, which is a great venue, but it doesn't really uh sound great for orchestras, you know. So, yep, venues change us. And now what about, I've been involved in a few <clears throat> amazingly epic projects that haven't always worked so well, but they've looked really great. Like when, when orchestras play with rock bands or DJs. Or, MSO did Kiss. Yeah, MSO did Kiss. Uh, Kiss Symphony, yeah. Um, and everyone, everyone had to have painted makeup. and uh, just... Yeah, hilarious. I mean, you look that yes. up. Look that up on YouTube. Kiss oh, I will Symphony, link it. MSO. Yeah, yeah. And Refined my... classical musicians with kiss makeup yeah, yeah that's yeah. a little humorous it's I'm so great you laughing? that's it was it was such an <laughs> epic gig because all the people in the orchestra almost all of them remember how 
when Kiss came out. It was just this glam rock, hilarious <laughs> band. And then and then MSO is playing with it. Metallica did the same thing. Metallica Symphony, I, I can't remember what it was called, but it was epic, you know, because I've always thought that metal metal bands and grunge bands, they have a really symphonic um, feeling to them. Their chords are really complex. The big power chords. This sounds, to me, sounds symphonic. And when Metallica paired up with symphony orchestras, I thought, oh, yes, this is it. This is epic. This is fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And so um, that came about in the, what, the 90s, the early early 90s? Yeah. And so that sort of triggered this idea that to make something super epic, it wasn't enough to just be loud and with a four-piece band. You had to have something big on stage as well (laughs) if you wanted maximum power shove an orchestra on that stage with you and so most of the time that's great when it's not great so here's the con of that i'm listening when it's not great it's because the the level that the rock band or the the djs or whatever are producing is so loud on the stage that whatever little microphones you've got um, little bug microphones trying to amplify the individual players the feedback on the stage is unbearable so the sound desk has to turn us right down what does that mean that means you can see us from the audience but you can't hear us you can see us smashing away but there's only this sort of vague impression that there's any String sounds it's coming. It's a really out. hard thing to deal with. I did. A, I played for TEDx in Kilda a few years ago with an Australian DJ, and there was three of us doing two violins and a cello, and they, they did amplify us that way, but it worked because they, you have to get the bounce right, and it's a lot harder with a microphone to an acoustic instrument than it is with other technology. Yeah, um, but that, certainly yeah. amplifying three string instruments is a lot easier with one DJ than it is an entire symphony orchestra. Yeah, but it also depends on the venue, the stage, the yes. level of sound yeah, on the too stage. Many variables. The yes. kind of microphones. And the, the, the other thing that goes back to episode one of Splitting Hairs for me is if you're playing with a DJ, if a DJ is playing cutting edge electronic music that they've made themselves, the purest rhythm, the most amazing electronic sounds. And some of you out there know that's my favorite music is electronic music. If you're doing that and then you've got these dusty old Baroque looking things with little microphones on them, <laughs> for me, it does not match. So let me tell you about a gig that was really great. I don't know if anyone's heard of Flight Facilities, but Flight Facilities were so beautiful. They're a Brisbane band. They came to the MSO, the Maya Bowl. Um, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous event. Why? Why was that good? And why were the other DJ gigs we did not so good? That, Tell me. That one was good because <laughs> the arrangements that they made um, gave the orchestra, showcased the orchestra. Instead of us just playing along with some really loud doof doof, the flight facilities actually wrote the arrangement. Well, the arranger for flight facilities. I'm so sorry. I can't remember who that is right now. Oh, we'll anyway. find it and link it. I think so. Oh, we have to link. No, we're going to link the most beautiful, beautiful thing ever in the in the uh, description. Flight facilities with the MSO at the Maya Music Bowl. You could hear the orchestra. When you needed to hear the orchestra, you could hear the orchestra. When That's there was awesome. a big build, you could hear everybody. It was great. So now we'll link all that because that's really cool. <laughs> And so there's this other group I want to talk about. They were this German trio called Brandt Bra Freak. And they were really <laughs> cool, right? And and they were sort of going a little bit viral just at the time where things were going viral. So maybe, I don't know, eight years ago or whatever. Um, and, and what went viral was uh, a YouTube – we should find this one too, actually um, – a YouTube clip of them – but they had orchestrated, they had arranged their own pop, um, pop, sorry. <laughs> They'd arranged their own um, tune for classical instruments. And so they were this um, electronic music trio, but they'd, they'd written out each part for violin, tuba, acoustic piano, was there a flute? I don't know. So they'd rearrange. It would. It's okay. Imagine Jimi Hendrix, um, Purple, Purple Haze, 
for the Kronos Quartet. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about something extremely cool being re revised into something arguably extremely daggy. But it was played really, really well. Okay, so I've this... played Beatles Lady Madonna on String Quartet. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's it was daggy. The Be- Beatles is <laughs> slightly different because they they actually used orchestral instruments at some point <laughs> in their career. But um, yeah, so so I'm going to link that too because that's an interesting, you know. An interesting technical experiment. Can you put electronic music backwards? Uh, so a- as far as a, a con- conceptual experiment, I think it was a really cool thing to do. But I felt so sorry for the violinist because she's like, she's got to play all these incredibly, incredibly difficult syncopated offbeat repetitive rhythms. Oh, there's nothing worse when you're trying to incorporate like stringed instruments into your new music and no. it's not as a, and it's not great i've had to do that oh yeah, especially when it's it's all about perfect pure rhythm and so the the conceptual uh, idea of this was a little bit cruel actually because if you want perfect rhythm you put on a metronome or a click track and you get a you get a piece of um you know you get a an algorithm <laughs> to do it for you you get a piece of technology to play perfectly rhythmically uh expecting a human to do that okay that's that's fine it's a cool experiment and i loved that that those guys and I bought their album and it was cool so we'll we'll link that up too but it's not kind of sustainable because if you can get a machine to do it 10 times better I'm not that these people weren't great they were really great they were great but are we going to uh, invest our time and energy into doing something that a machine would do much better and that actually goes back to our topic uh, machines can make violins now, so why should humans? But you don't believe in that, so that's fine. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was like a – that was a um, – I don't even know if that made it into an episode, did it? That. Uh, um, I, but I was just talking about people still value handmade. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. So the analogy wasn't saying? 100% great. So let's move on to – okay, so we've got <sighs> – Technology, recording technology, performance technology, microphones. Okay, what's better than a bug mic on an acoustic daggy old violin? Well, the the rise of the electric violin and other amplified instruments. Yeah, so let's just focus that, on the electric violin. That which, really that cha- that changed it, I think. That, yeah, that came about in sort of the eighties, really. The rise of it happened in the eighties with the flying V and all these like guitar type electric violins oh, some of them are so wacky looking it's just like yeah and and you know that's fine they're allowed to but it doesn't feel like it's classical music do, do you know what it's i'm a, saying yeah, it, it's it sounds like it, it doesn't no no and no one was trying to link it to classical music i think what was happening was i i believe i can't generalize but i believe a violinist who didn't want to be old-fashioned anymore there was no choice except to go to these kind of guitar style electric violins. There's no middle ground there in the eighties. It was just like ultra pop glam, um, purple <laughs> flying V metallic, you know, electric, you know, like guitar solos, Jimi Hendrix, all of that stuff. So I reckon it was just like copying the guitar um, trajectory actually, which is, that's great. That's kind of cool. But what manufacturers kind of missed out on was an opportunity to find that middle ground. How can we play our modern classical music on something that looks like what Kiss would play on? You know what I mean? So there was sort of no no link um, yet. So obviously you know where I'm going with this because there is now people are much more interested in, oh, okay, so we can use um, – Violins that don't look so crazy because there's lots and lots of brands out there. You know what my favorite is, of course, it's Spur Violins. They're all wooden, they're beautifully sounding, they're much more acoustic sounding and they're much more traditional looking, but they've got this slight modern twist. So they kind of blend into classical music a little bit I feel that they're, they're the real sort of middle ground between a beautiful traditional acoustic yeah. and your insane looking electrics yeah absolutely i feel like that those kind of amplified instruments they were inevitable i think people were looking at the violin and looking at what people want to do 
with music and amplification and this kind of trajectory was inevitable. It just came about in the really 20, 21st century. Yeah, that's right. And the the reason it didn't um, happen until just, just recently, I think, is because uh, there was too much of a divide between popular music and classical music. And that came about too in the 80s where the 80s was where instrument prices and old instruments and all that hoo-ha – Blew, blew totally out of proportion in the 80s. And also the 80s was the rise of pop music, film clips, um, you know, uh, technology as being a big part of music, you know, synth, pop and all of that kind of stuff. And and if a violinist wanted to be involved with that, then that had to be much more rock, glam, electric guitar style. You couldn't bring your daggy old violin into that world. I mean, even Bond, that string quartet, even Bond used electric violins, Yamaha, you know. Um, anyone who did anything pop, Yamaha was right there to bejewel their violins. You know, so Yamaha sort of got that, okay, there's pop violin stuff happening. There's pop string stuff happening. Mm. What are we going to do? So they just kind of knock up this this um, simple electric violin and they just give it to people, you know. But it, it's not really, for me, it's not the most artistic cl- solution that links to the past because it I still think, looks metallic and, you know. Uh, I, I think, and you can see it clearly when you see those pop groups like that, um, it becomes a prop rather than really thinking about, is that instrument giving you the sound that you're really after? Or is it, is it, is it more of a tool to fit the look of the show that you're doing? Yeah, that's right. If you want that. That is perfectly okay. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, and if you don't want that, because some people, it's just priorities. If you want it, it's fine. If you don't, then you have to keep looking around for something that will help you with what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's right. And I think the aesthetic is really important too, because some people are, I find that classical musicians, especially in, in our um, area, like in Australia, um, we're insecure about playing music. So I don't like ugly, ugly red varnish. Oh, yeah, uh, we, we know that from episode one, I think, actually. Yeah, I'm just sort of – we're at 13 now. I need to restate it every few episodes. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> – but, you know, people like people like you, you are a traditionalist. You do not want ugly red varnish. You do not want um, a flying V violin. You you are not that person. And oh, I, but I've – sorry, go on. And, and a lot of people don't want to identify with the ultra-pop 80s glam that was – that's not what they're trying to say. However, if you do want to break out a little bit from the classical music, if you want, uh, but but you don't want to stick out too much, and that's the Australian thing of not sticking out too much, but just kind of trying something oh. a little bit new, then Spur Violins covers that because you can blend in. Well, but- I, I definitely have seen modern looking instruments and liked them. And I've even said that I would sit in a professional orchestra and play a cornerless violin. And you, you, you confronted me on that in episode one. I said, "Yeah, I would do it. I don't care. I like the traditional-looking instruments, and I like the modern ones. But I, 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 I yeah, no, I'll, I'll play whatever if it sounds good, except yeah. for ugly red varnish. Yeah. Well, that's that's a personal choice. So, what has the, the final thing I think we should cover? in terms of technology is how social media has changed our attitudes or changed the way we play or changed whatever. Yes, because in this year of 2020, yep. uh, coronavirus threw us all mm. onto the web Yep, and we had to adapt. Yep. So that that was we were all forced to look at what we've got around us to go, how do we keep going? How do we stay relevant? Yeah. Concerts, lessons, whatever. Mm-hmm. And that was, you know, Zoom and Instagram and yep. Facebook and, and YouTube, YouTube. Yep, and absolutely. online lessons. Yep. And- yeah, you've got such a good point about that. We have had to totally revise the way we do things because of this coronavirus situation. Yeah. One of the first things I bought was a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Which you are using. Which right I'm now. using right now. Okay. I think the, I think, <laughs> I think the 21st century... Um, you know, brought about all this other new technology. And I I definitely think it's incredible. Uh, 2020 
really everybody from professional orchestras to individual teachers to whatever it is through us online if we wanted to keep this stuff going um, I had to teach online and I will say and I've had lessons online and I will say I think that's been a good thing but for me personally I felt that was a hindrance to you you, you just lose something from being in person with a student or a teacher. Yep. You lose something from being in a live concert hall. Yeah, um, from not I, being in a live concert from hall. Not yeah. Being, yeah, uh, from not being there. Yep. I think um, jumping online and having thousands of recordings all the way from the 60s through to now that you can just jump on YouTube and see this tech, you know, mm. what people, people have been able to do. Yep. People record master classes. You know, if I want to hear a master class from the concert master of Bill, uh, Vienna Philharmonic, like mm -hmm. it's right there. I can just look it up. I can hear different types of performances of the same piece. Um, if I want to have a lesson with you right now, let's go. Like we can do that. Even though I'm in Canberra, by the way, did you know I'm in Canberra? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's made everything so much more possible. But I I do personally think that some things to do with technology are a hindrance. Oh well, I mean, people were already on the screen too much before 2020, and now they are on the screen thanks to this pandemic. The screen has absolutely taken over and i believe that a lot of the mental illness that has happened to myself and to other people have been because we are on the screen too much and it just depresses you so let me just a little friendly splitting hairs word of advice go for a walk yes don't stay on the screen too I much i can't i'm actually in quarantine for you are literally <laughs> in quarantine you can't you can't go for a walk all right yeah well look i think that's that's completely uh, reasonable, that whole talk we've just had. I, I think technology should not be ignored. It should be embraced to a point. Uh, yeah. Be mindful of what you are losing by embracing the technology and consider technolo the technological advances for string playing. Consider them from the Baroque period to now. Consider them, try them out. Even if it's just briefly, even if it's to learn that you hate playing on raw gut, just do it. You yeah, because then you'll you then you will be an authority. You will be able to say, "I've you, done it." Uh, yeah, are you gaining something from trying this thing, or are you losing something, or like just it's just worth experimenting and have a looking at looking at it. And... Absolutely. Well, I think we totally nailed today, Annabelle. What do you think? I enjoyed it. Loved it. <laughs> All right. See you for episode fourteen, whatever that may be. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, yeah. bye. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Splitting Hairs. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, and if you're listening on one of the audio-only platforms, jump over to YouTube where you can see more content and what we look like. <laughs> I'm the young one. Like, share, and subscribe, and we have all the social medias like normal people, so go and follow us there as well. Awesome. Okay, bye. What's up? Bye.